Okay. Well, hello. I'm going to talk about pan evolution, <clears throat> or pan evo for short, the evolution of information and biology's part in this, your part in this, you're crucial to this, all of you. But first of all, why is an evolutionary biologist speaking to you? <clears throat> well, this goes back to before I was born. Back in the middle of last century, when the first computers were being built, a person called Claude Shannon took a brief break away from riding his unicycle down the corridor while juggling in order to invent information theory centered around this thing H or information. Don't worry about the equation. I'm not going to use it at all. He also invented something called mutual information, which is not just the information in, say, a transmitted message, but in the received message as well, how much correspondence there is between those, roughly speaking. Um, information and mutual information can also be used for all sorts of other things, like one computer program and another computer program, or one set of genes and another set of genes. <clears throat> Anything, really. These measures were fairly quickly taken up in ecology. Oh, we see it. here we are. Um, spearheaded by a person called Margalef from Barcelona. And it was added to two other measures which are mathematically related, 0H and 0MI and 2H and 2MI. These other measures in grey have some terrible drawbacks built into them. Despite the use of all of these things in ecology, for a long time, no one was using 1H and 1MI in genetics, which was surprising because Shannon himself had a go at using in genetics, but didn't publish. And these two people, Lewontin and Ewens, very famous geneticists, had also had a try at using it for genes. But luckily, <clears throat> I didn't know about any of these attempts. So about 16 years ago, I thought, why aren't we applying information theory to measuring and forecasting what is going on with genes, which are definitely information? Now, my maths wasn't fully up to this task, but with the help of engineers, physicists and mathematicians, especially Fong Shabu, Roddy Dua and Anne Chow, I showed that in many cases, information theory, these things in yellow in the middle, um, was a much better way of measuring and forecasting in genetics. So that's my backstory, why I was interested in connections between information theory and genes. So now we get on to the question that Evelina Shagroshka, again, apologies for pronunciation, talked about so well in the last half hour. Is artificial intelligence going to help or harm biology, including us? Well, it's a very important question, but I would say that in evolution, there is another question that comes before that. How different and similar are biology and artificial intelligence? And my answer is that they are very similar because they are both types of information. So how do we think about biology and non-biology in a unified way? First of all, we need to know a definition of life. Um, there are gazillions of definitions and a lot of heated argument, but all of definitions have the ideas that life is ordered in some way, like the leaves being ordered down the stem of this plant or her hair being ordered onto her head, and that living things can reproduce sometimes with variation which we'll discuss more in a moment. What about information? Well, it's also ordered. If the letters in that word information were not in that order, it wouldn't convey the same information to us. And in the early Earth, there were chemicals which were ordered, like that one there is ordered in a certain way. And some of the chemicals could reproduce and some of them could vary and they still do that today. So 
I'll discuss this more in a moment. So basically what information does is very similar to what life does. So what are all the things that biological systems and non-biological systems can do? Basically, there are four things that can be done by both of them. Innovation, transmission, adaptation, and movement. These things have been happening always. Let's look at innovation first. In the biological realm, you've probably heard of mutation of DNA. Look just here at the left-hand end of the top DNA molecule. There's a yellow and purple base pair. And in this, the other one, it's been changed to a blue and red base pair. So there's been a DNA sequence mutation. There can also be what are called epigenetic changes, where other chemicals, e.g. a methyl group, can be added to the DNA, which may change the way it behaves. Then there are innovations that don't involve DNA. For example, changes in behavior, which in humans we sometimes call cultural changes. A recent innovation that was a few years ago, goat stopped meaning this animal here and started meaning greatest of all time, etc. There are lots of these. In the non-biological world, there is also in innovation, like this stalactite growing very slowly upwards in Mexico, or this cliff being slowly worn down by this waterfall. And there's also a human guided but non-biological innovation, such as two that are particularly relevant to all of us at this conference, are evolutionary program and neural networks, and so forth. Many of these things you probably use. So what about transmission? You've probably all heard of sperm meets ovum, and therefore DNA sequence gets inherited. Also, sometimes, those epigenetic marks can get inherited. There's also non-DNA inheritance. Individuals can inherit a nest site or inherit a house from their parents and all sorts of other things. There's about 10 different forms of biological transmission. I'm only listing a few of them here. And there's transmission that doesn't involve inheritance at all, like when you learn something from a teacher who's not your relative and that changes the culture. Um, in the non-biological realm, there's obviously electronic transmission. And very importantly for my talk, this includes self-replication on a massive scale through electronic circuits and so forth. This massive self-replication, such as the malware that we all hate, uh, and things that we like too, will be very important in a moment, and increasingly this self-replication is happening autonomously. Then also in the non-biological realm, there's physical replication, autocatalytic chemicals, which have been around, as far as we know, since the universe began, certainly since the Earth began. This is where chemicals catalyze synthesis of copies of themselves. Here is one of those chemicals called RB or ZNRB, depending on a slight chemical difference at one end. And if that finds its building blocks in the environment, it can pull them towards it, link them together and make another copy of itself. And as time goes on, there can be increasingly rapid synthesis of RB or ZNRB as there are more and more of these chemicals making more and more of themselves. Until, of course, the component parts run out and the environment doesn't have them anymore. What about adaptation? Well, in the biological world, variants compete. Heritable variants that have poor transmission or survival. Surprise, surprise, they don't transmit or they don't survive, and so they gradually disappear. Also, non-heritable variants, like learned variants, can disappear. Um, in the early 1990s, there was a phrase, cowabunga dude, which has now been 
replaced by other expressions which mean good, like goat that we saw just before. There's also adaptation in the non-biological world. In the example of those two chemicals I showed you before, if ZNRB is zapped by UV radiation, which is present in many environments, then it converts to RB, and actually RB self-replicates faster than ZNRB does. So before long, there will be virtually no ZNRB in the environment at all. We say that RB is better adapted to that particular environment. Likewise with electronic adaptation, we often compete variant codes against each other with the massive replication is in the removal of low performers. This relative to biological situations where there's, there is huge replication, but often not as big as with electronics. <coughs> Finally, movement. In the biological world, individuals can move very fast, like this cheetah, and Seeds and pollen can move enormous distances through the air and also in the case of pollen, pollen cause um, cause hay fever, which I have at the moment. Incidentally, it doesn't really matter so much from this talk, but I just thought I'd tell you, this changes the mutual information between areas and therefore it changes the adaptive potential that I was just talking about. Also, movement in the non-biological world obviously happens. Everything from molecules being spewed out from this new volcano through to the very slow movement of the continents that we can actually measure today, and through to the astronomical scale with um, comets and planets and galaxies whizzing around. Electronic movement happens also. It can move due to a machine being moved with the information in it, or it can go down cables like this, or it can be radio transmitted. So there's plenty of electronic movement. So that's these four processes for both biology and non-biology. And now what about the connections between them? Well, non-biological innovation, particularly AI, is now an integral part of our cultural innovation in biology. Going in the other direction, transmission and adaptation in biology have been mimicked very closely in evolutionary programming to help us make a better code in the electronic world. Movement um, interaction can go both ways. And one interesting thing is that exactly the same programs, uh, sorry, algorithms and um, algebra can be used to model the movement in both realms, the non-biological and the biological. <clears throat> so biology and non-biology can both do all these four basic processes now. And um, sorry. There is one other really important connection. All these physical processes on the right-hand side of the screen have been going on since the Earth began, well, since the universe began, we are pretty sure. Now we can see many ways in which these physical processes can combine to produce things which look very much like simple forms of life as we know it. Of course, we cannot go back 3.5 billion years to check out which of these processes autocatalytically produced the first single cell fossils, but it seems overwhelmingly likely that something like that happened to produce biology that also does these four th things with its information. So, we're all just one big happy mess of information. What is the meaning for me, 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 and of course, you, you, you? Well, to repeat what I just said, information has been doing these four things forever, innovation, transmission, adaptation, and movement. And a little bit of information is in biology, and a little bit of biology is human. So this is your place in the universe. 
tiny, tiny dot within a tiny, tiny dot. A bit humbling, but there you are. That's us. The other important thing is that some information from humans is now doing these four things by, by itself. So to summarize that in a different way, it is um, suggested, we don't know this of course, because we haven't gone back 3.5 billion years, that the autocatalysis in the physical world produced those very primitive single cell forms that we saw that many years ago in the rocks. And the process has continued to produce organisms with DNA sequences these DNA sequences, in some cases, produced nerves, which can do the learning. Is everything okay? I can hear some talking. Um, and from the learning, we've produced mobile phones, computers, rovers on Mars, etc. evolutionary algorithms, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and just as another aside, the maths of quantum computing is perfectly suited to dealing with DNA variants within populations and between populations. But I won't talk about that anymore today. So now we get onto the question that Ewelina was talking about in the previous half hour. Should we worry about this? And well, I don't recommend worrying but um, I do think we should think about it. The first thing we need to think about is that will humans and AI behave intelligently? Um, neither of these is certain. Rich and Garekas published an important paper a few years ago about what they called humans' natural stupidity. Humans sometimes, or some of them quite often, do extraordinarily stupid things. Turning to artificial simulated stupidity um, often there can be hallucinations or what I like to call ass, artificial simulated stupidity, such as the recent advice by AI for us to put glue in pizzas and eat rocks. No one is going to do those, are they? <coughs> but taking the optimistic view, supposing humans and AI do both become in, more intelligent, then humans might get better at evaluating information which is what Evelina talked a lot about in politics and all sorts of other things. We're seeing a lot of need for evaluating information in politics just going on at the moment in a number of countries and also in more personal decisions like will you, how, will you decide whether you're going to let your car choose where to drive itself off to when it breaks need fixing? Do you trust your car to choose the best service, or is it going to go to some shonky dealer? The other important thing here is that if AI is actually intelligent, then it is likely to choose the best environment for itself, which I contend will lead to minimal competition with humans. Why do I say that? Well, look, here's on the left. Here is the optimal environment for biology, including humans. It needs lots of water, lots of oxygen, lots of carbon dioxide to grow the plants we eat, a very narrow range of temperatures, and a very small amount of cosmic radiation. Whereas you compare that with the environment that's optimal for information and the machines that information is in, oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, are all corrosive to machines. So that's bad environment for machines. Also, machines can be manufactured, not all of them are, but they can be manufactured to tolerate a very wide range of temperatures compared to biology and a very wide range of cosmic radiation. So um, non-biological and biological information are best suited to very different environments.
So how might these two different types of information in humans and in machines behave? Well, I'm going to divert to a bit of biology for a moment and look at what happens in biology when a single group diverges into two that specialize in different environments. Some of you may have heard the saying, as American as apple pie. Well, unfortunately, this is a lie. Actually, apples were not in the Americas until Europeans took them there about 300 years ago. At first, there were no or few insect pests that attacked apples. But after a while, a few variant hawthorn berry flies from hawthorn trees started breeding at a slightly different time that allowed them to put their babies, their grubs, into apples instead of into hawthorn berries. Nowadays, the two groups of hawthorn berry flies and apple flies do not compete because they're specialised to a different environment, an apple tree or a hawthorn tree. And they rarely interbreed successfully because of not only the different mating time, but other genetic differences that have accumulated. So this is very much like what we are seeing with information leaving us and going into another realm, <coughs> AI, where the information is increasingly autonomous and importantly, is best suited to a very different environment. So like the Hawthorne and Apple environments, biological and non-biological information are not likely to compete strongly with one another because they are best suited to different environments. Biology needs environments that are quite abundant on Earth, but extremely rare in the rest of the universe. Non-biology is best suited to environments that are scarce on Earth, but abundant everywhere else, including the Moon and Mars. So there is very good reason for most non-biological information to preferentially move to those places. So a summary of all this is that biology is a part of information. It innovates, transmits, adapts, moves, like all other information. And information from our brains is moving into its own environment, which is likely very different from the environments we prefer. So harm to biology will be minimal if humans evaluate information and cooperate, and AI learns to avoid artificial simulated stupidity better than it does at the moment all of which this conference is about. So just to finish up, there are a couple of references here. Here's the paper in a journal called Biology, where most of this is summarised, including the citations of everyone who I've talked about. This next reference is about my backstory. It's a more pretty good summary of my backstory. And finally, just a little um, advertising break from me. My maths and my computing are only just good enough to do what I do in this field. So if anyone would like to contact me, please contact me on this email. Thank you to the organisers for inviting me and thank you to all of you for listening. <laughs>